Thanks, Eamon, and thanks very much to um, Eamon, Mark and colleagues for inviting me to uh, give a keynote today. It's a real, um, a real pleasure. I hope you can see the slides okay. I have a fair few of them and I have a video later on, so if there's any problem with the, um, with the visibility, please just shout. Um, yeah, my name's Sean Bain. Um, I'm from the University of Edinburgh. I thought I'd start with a nice little bit of um, Edinburgh eye candy to try and lure you all to come and visit the city at Christmas when it looks its best. Um, and I'm going to be speaking today about the manifesto for um, teaching online that we developed at uh, the University of Edinburgh, and importantly about how that manifesto links to what I see as um, current and future trajectories for research in this area. So, um, Eamon's already in introduced me, but I, I'm the director of our reasonably newly launched Centre for Research in Digital Education, which is based in uh, the School of Education. Um, so, we have kind of four research themes that we address in our research centre, learning analytics, higher education policy, um, digital culture, and children and technology. Um, so, do check out our website if you get a moment. Um, I also teach on our Masters, our MSc in Digital Education, which is one of the first distance education programmes to be offered by the University of Edinburgh. Big programme, got about 200 students on it um, across 40 different nations. So this is all just by way of giving you a bit of context to what I want to talk about um, in my keynote this morning. In terms of the wider context of, um, of what we do at the University of Edinburgh, I suppose we're quite fairly active in the field of digital education, particularly in terms of online um, and distance learning. So we, we have about 64 um, fully online master's programmes at Edinburgh, and we've had a 10-year period of quite heavy investment in online distance learning in the university. So we now have a, about 2,500 distance postgraduate students. And it's done that thing. I, I made this on a PC and the Mac has kind of crunched it all up, so sorry about that. Um, but we have a target, an expansion target for online distance learning. For uh, We're hoping to have, a few years from now, 10,000 distance students. Um, so strategically, we've been really quite invested in this area uh, of digital education. Uh, we were one of the early um, European universities delivering MOOCs, and we now have a portfolio of 35 um, MOOCs across three platforms and again with a kind of modest growth um, ambitions in terms of MOOC delivery. At the moment we have a, getting, on, getting close to two and a half million MOOC learners. Um, we're also growing distance PhDs and we have a really, really quite strong I would say practitioner and research communities in digital education in the university. So you know, all that, I'm, I'm telling you all that because I think Edinburgh is a pretty good place to be doing this stuff but it's also a good place in which to be thinking about what it means to conduct digital education and how the digital is shifting and changing what it means to teach both now and in the future. So this is, this is what I'm going to be talking about um, this morning. I want to introduce our manifesto for teaching online so I'll just explain how that came about and what we were trying to do by developing a manifesto for this area. And I'm, I'm, I'm then going to dig into two particular areas that that manifesto um, looks at what, teacher automation and the notion of university space and think about how research in digital education is asking us to really, really question um, those two particular areas. I could have chosen others and it's quite hard when I talk about the manifesto to kind of choose which areas to drill down into. But for me, I think these are a couple of the most interesting and important ones facing um, teachers and researchers in digital education at the moment. So we, we first wrote our manifesto for teaching online back in 2011 and it was written by a team of about five of us who were teaching on the master's programme in digital education. Um, don't bother trying to read this, I'm gonna sh I'll show you a video in a minute which will like, make it a little bit more accessible. But what we felt at the time was that um, digital education needed some provocation, it needed some sort of, we wanted to write some short punchy statements which would provoke new kinds of critical thinking around the area of digital education. In particular, we wanted to counter a tendency um, in the field not to adopt critical approaches, but rather to sort of default to these uh, sort of instrumentalist or and determinist ways of thinking about technology. And we wanted to build um, a critical approach to practice based on our experience as teachers within our masters in digital education and our experience as researchers in this field. Um, when I talk about instrumentalism and determinism, I'm, 
I'm really referring to a paper written by um, Hamilton and Norm Fr and Friesen back in, in 2013, where they described digital education as being dominated by these two particular discourses. Instrumentalism, which sees technology as kind of neutral means for um, ends determined independently by their users, so technology as a kind of tool, if you like. And we see this discourse a lot in the kind of terminologies that we use around the field of digital education when we talk about things like putting pedagogy before technology, using technology to enhance learning, developing toolkits for innovative learning. We're talking about the technology as though it is simply a tool to apply to a stable existing set of practices. And then when we talk about determinism, again I'm drawing on Hamilton and Friesen's paper, um, where they, they talk about technology, this is another perspective on technology which sees it as driving social practice. Um, and we must, as humans, adapt um, to, to technological change. So when we talk in our field about harnessing the power of technology or using technology to transform education, we're, kind of, we're, we're talking about technology as though it's taking us in new directions and we have no choice but to follow it. And these are two kind of perspectives which I want to challenge a little bit as I, as I talk this morning. Um, I should say that I, I, all the references I'm going to use in this paper, I tweeted them earlier today. They're in a Google document. So if anyone out there is on Twitter and could re retweet that tweet, that would be great. There's a link to um, all these references, so you don't need to be trying to write them down. Okay, so when the, when the 2011 manifesto um, came out, it got a fair bit of publicity, actually, particularly in the States, following... Um, an article that was written in the in Inside Higher Ed, um, you know, the, the journalist there said that we were, were trying a different kind of advocacy tack, which was suited to the viral culture of the modern web. It was a really nice article for us, but I think it was based on a misunderstanding. We weren't necessarily advocating digital education. We were trying to provoke thinking around digital education, which is a subtle but important difference, I feel. Um, People were saying it was a, the most exciting document to emerge in, um, in 2012. Some people were questioning whether we really needed this kind of pop culture, meme-like approach to thinking about digital education. Um, others were saying it had important um, implications for the ways in which universities and schools thought about providing educational services. So it made, it made a, you know, a modest but kind of reasonable splash um, at the time. Uh, but then when it came to the, the earlier this year, we, we felt that things had really moved on substantially since 2011. Um, by 2016, we'd seen the rise of the, kind of the wave of MOOCs. We'd seen a big focus of attention on open education in all its various forms. We'd seen a rise in questions around automation, big data, um, machine learning. Um, so we felt it was time to actually revise and rewrite the manifesto at that point. Um, and at which point we did introduce some new, some new kind of um, manifesto points on these topics. Um, I should say I brought some manifestos along with me and after, after, uh, in the break I'm, I'm going to put them on the table outside if anyone wants them. If, if they run out, just email me and I'll send you some. Um, okay, so before I move on, I wanted to actually let you, let you see what we actually say in the manifesto and how we say it by showing you um, this video, which was uh, produced by one of our PhD students, James Lamb, um, which presents um, the, the manifesto um, in a kind of audiovisual form. So this video is about three minutes long. I hope the sound will be okay. This essay will explore this notion of the urban planner and cultural heritage studies with mobile augmented reality using select locations in New York City as the environment to be mediated and mediated. Sea change of 
metamorphosis that's underway in the provision of feedback in higher education. In order to perceive this sea change, we have to look at a range of, of sources which come together and intersect in various ways. Profoundly collaborative dialogic structures of the web are really not a natural fit with many of the profoundly individualist assumptions that we make about what it is to be an author. educational interaction is best understood as being fundamentally dialogic. among people as to the extent to which a bot can or should appear to replace the teachers, replace the teachers, replace the teachers. a lot in there. Um, I'm just going to, like, as I say, dig into two particular aspects of, of, of what, we've, what we've tried to address in the manifesto. I haven't really got time to look at digital textuality, to look at assessment and various other aspects, but I'll look at these, um, I'll look at these two particular clusters of points. <coughs> so we have, um, we have a, a, a couple of new points in the 2016 manifesto relating to this issue of the automation of the teacher. Um, just to try to kind of prompt a new kind of thinking about what it might mean to automate the teacher function, it might mean to automate aspects of what we do as teachers. I was a little bit dismayed, I have to admit, in that video when James sort of faded my voice out saying, replace the teacher, replace the teacher, because that isn't my intention at all. Um, but I think it's an interesting way of thinking about, about where we're going in terms of um, artificial intelligence and uh, big data when it comes to education. So really this cluster of points was designed to address this kind of upsurge in, in research interest in really in the last couple of years around the automation of work um, and around the automation of professional work. So this was the, this was the key theme of the um, World um, Economics Forum conference in Davos earlier this year was on the fourth industrial revolution. Um, the sense that all kinds of work um, is shifting through the incursions of uh, big data through um, improvements in machine learning algorithms. Um, the famous study that was done in the Oxford Martins School um, about three years ago um, sort of surfaced this idea that 47% you know, of US jobs are at risk of computerization. 
Um, so it seems like a sort of massive shift in the way we think about what it means to be a professional is coming up over the next few years, um, and it's to do with how we choose or decide or are forced to interface our professional work with technology. Um, just to give a few examples, um, IBM's Watson supercomputer has been kind of pitched as the, the it will soon be the best doctor in the world. Um, so this is the IBM Watson artificial intelligence, which will be, um, it's argued, uniquely able to work across the massive influx and emergence of health data um, and will be able to function as a diagnostic engine beyond the kind of wildest dreams of, the hu of human doctors. Um, the, the, the Watson supercomputer, in the context of healthcare, is a diagnostic engine. It's not a doctor. And I think this is, this is an important theme which emerges through our discussions of the automation of professional work. What we need to think about is how humans work with and alongside technology. But what we're seeing in much of the kind of dominant um, press kind of discourses around this field are, is this kind of fantasy of supersession. You know, no more human doctors. We're going to have supercomputers. Um, so that's the, the IBM kind of doctor. Then there's a, some of these, some of these kind of, um, I don't know, interventions in automation are much more bottom up. So uh, this is one of my favourites. It's uh, the world's first robot lawyer, and it's developed by, as, a, as, as these things always are, a Stanford graduate um, based in the UK um, called Joshua uh, Browder, who developed an automated kind of legal services bot on the internet. It's fantastic. I signed up to this a couple of weeks ago. You, you know, you sign up, and then it's designed to help you challenge parking tickets. Um, it, does, it does some other things as well, but the parking tickets thing is great. Unfortunately, I don't think, I don't think, they, I don't think it applies in Ireland yet. It's US and UK at the moment. Um, but basically, it, you, know, you probably can't read that text. It asks you a few questions about where your car was parked when you got the ticket. Could you read the signs properly? Was it clear what was going on? And then it generates a letter for you to send to your council um, to challenge your parking tickets. Fantastic. 66% success rate, apparently, in challenging um, parking tickets. Um, and then it feels like journalism, for example. So there is, there's been a lot of focus on that recently as well. The Associated Press Agency is now publishing 3,000 um, news articles every quarter, which are generated by an artificial intelligence rather than by a human journalist. Um, and as one of the Guardian journalists wrote uh, a few months back, you know, maybe these, maybe these artificial intelligences working in journalism, they won't necessarily be about writing high quality journal, um, articles, but they'll be about personalizing articles. So if you could have an artificial intelligence which personalized a news article and told you, you know, the example he, that he uses here is exactly how your family will be affected by a war in a different country, um, you know, that's something that could not be achieved by a human writer. So as with all these things, there are losses and gains. Um, but to return to the topic, uh, the, the, our kind of core topic today, which is teaching, um, the work that was conducted at Oxford a few years ago on um, the likelihood of the computerization or automation of, of jobs, kind of, I don't, know if you can, I don't know if you can read that, but it suggested that the, like, the likelihood of teaching and educational professionals' work being um, taken over by computers is, is 4%, it's very, very low, um, uh, only slightly higher than health professionals. Whereas in other jobs, such as sales um, and more manual tasks, it's, it's very much a uh, higher possibility. Of course, this is because teaching is a highly creative profession, it's non-routine and it's very social. But I found it interesting uh, when I was researching this to think about, to, to look at how how the economists talk about the automation of education. So in this particular University of Oxford report, you know, they, they sorry, there's a bit of a long quote, but um, it said, you know, it talks about education as being typically a low productivity growth sector um, because the teaching methods are typically labor intensive, use limited technology, and labor costs rise when wages in such sectors have to compete with other sectors where technology is raising productivity. So they say, in one sense, the rising share of national income spent on education is not a huge problem because rising productivity and wages in other sectors allows us to afford it. Um, so, so basically, if, as, as we get wealthier, we can choose to continue to fund education to a high uh, level, but then it seems to me that that's quite a big if. Um, but then they go on to say, on the other hand, 
it could be that there will be technologies which will um, increase productivity in education um, and drive down costs. So, and then they use the examples of um, lecture capture. Um, these reports often talk about MOOCs and provision of education on a massive scale um, or online distance, tutor light, online distance education. Often, you know, these aren't, these aren't things that we would necessarily count as teaching. So on the one hand, we're saying we have a, we can choose if we want to socially to, um, to fund education, but we might also want to look at how we can use technology to increase efficiency. Um, so I think it's a very kind of torn um, discourse and it's very often very at odds with itself in terms of how, how technology and automation of the, t of the teacher function um, should come together. So just to give, I think there are various kind of, I think so, I want to give a very quick overview of some of the ways in which as the teaching profession we are currently thinking about technology um, as standing in for some of what we do. So learning analytics is a, you know, probably one of the most um, prominent examples at the moment, how we use data about our students to help us understand and improve their education um, is, is something that we're all, you know, many of us are quite interested in, including myself. Um, I think what we need to think about learning and analytics as being is a, a kind of inscribing or inscribing the agency of our teachers onto data. So instead of teachers having this kind of tacit understanding and awareness of their class and how they're progressing and where they might be stuck and what they might need to do to proceed, um, we are using data to, um, to kind of visualize that in a very different way. And that, that is about how we are reconceiving and reconceptualizing what it means to teach and what, it, what teacher professionalism might consist of. Um, similarly with intelligent tutoring and adaptive learning where we're looking at ways in which computer software can simulate a human tutor. Um, again, there's a very clearly a cost efficiency um, driver often associated with intelligent tutoring. Um, lecture capture is another one. I, I don't know if you have much lecture capture here. We're just currently investing in it in quite a big way at Edinburgh. We're, spending millions on putting um, lecture recording into 400 big lecture theatres. Again, this is a way of reconceiving what it means to teach, isn't it, I, I think. I mean, the teacher will no longer be present or be expected to be present in the room with the students, but will be um, exist in different ways in relation to uh, the student body. Automated assessment and algorithmic, algorithmic marking is another interesting one. Um, by which I don't, I don't really mean the automated marking of um, multiple choice questions, but the, the capacity of machine learning to enable us to automatically mark essays, for example. Um, and there's been a, um, a, a campaign against this in the US, which has been running for three or four years now, which has been signed by many thousands of academics, including Noam Chomsky, that's the one that I've highlighted down the bottom there, against this idea that we should ask our machines to mark our students' essays. Um, and then in, school, in the school sector, the, the behaviour and award systems have really become quite popular over recent years. I don't know um, whether you have much use of Class Dojo, for example, um, in Ireland, in Scotland and England. It's, it's, it's big. It's a way of automate, automating the ways in which teachers manage the behaviour of their students. Um, and it's a way of opening up the record of student behaviour um, in the classroom directly to parents. So there are you know, potential issues there around surveillance um, and so on. Um, plagiarism detection systems, I mean, uh, one of the most widely used learning technologies we have. Again, it inscribes the teacher's capacity to understand and spot and address where a student is plagiarising. Um, it, it, it inscribes that agency onto a machine in a way which is often problematic and has been critiqued quite um, widely. Um, we're seeing a rise now of campus-wide artificial intelligences. So um, Deakin University, for example, now uses, again, IBM's Watson um, to function as an answer engine for students across the whole of um, the Deakin campus. Um, in fact, just last week, Pearson announced a partnership with, um, with IBM and Watson to use Watson as an adaptive learning tutor across all the Pearson education suite. And then finally, automated teaching assistants. I don't know if you saw the case um, at Georgia Tech um, last year where um, a, a, 
professor on one of their computing science courses without, without telling the students, again used Watson, um, to design a, an automated teaching assistant. Set that loose in this course of 300 students and then there was a big reveal at the end of the course that this, you know, guess what, this, this, this TA had been um, an artificial intelligence all along, you know, to mingled kind of horror and delight. Um, and we have a similar, actually, no, not a similar, quite a different um, development at Edinburgh at the moment in terms of our teacher bot, which, we've, which I've spoken about elsewhere and I can answer questions on later if anyone's interested. So I think, the, I think for me, to, to make this kind of conceptual shift from thinking about what we do with technology as being about using technology as a set of tools to, to thinking about technology as somewhere we inscribe our agency as teachers is quite an important conceptual shift. Um, because for me it's important to bear in mind that the means by which we inscribe our agency onto these technologies um, is often you know, highly mediated by venture capital, by big commercial companies like IBM, Pearson and so on, um, uh, who you know, won't necessarily have the interests of teachers and students at heart in the same way that we, we might do as um, teachers. So Ben Williamson writes really um, fantastically on this stuff um, and points out that you know, there's this huge investment of venture capital going into ed tech at the moment and we need to think about that, and about how, it, how we respond to that landscape of heavy investment and heavy technology as teachers. I think there are various problems and issues that kind of emerge around this area, which is you know, heavily driven by computing science um, and uh, often, as I've said, the cost efficiency kind of, or the apparent cost efficiency benefits of automation. I think sometimes these technologies tend to render the teacher invisible. I've been looking at quite a few of these kind of systems diagrams of uh, artificial intelligence systems and adaptive tutors and so on. And it's often really hard to see where the teacher agency is positioned in these diagrams. You can, again, the, the visuals aren't great here, you probably can't see that so well, but you can usually see where the learner is in these diagrams, it's usually somewhere around the center. But it's, it's very rare to see where the teacher and the expertise of the teacher is um, coming in to the, to the system. It's usually very heavily black boxed under something like pedagogical model or, or, or so on. So I think that's an issue and something that we as teachers need to think about and address. And I think associated with this, there is a kind of, the politics of algorithms are something that we need to address. So I would, um, I would recommend to you the work by Introna and Hayes, if you haven't already seen it, who look, who, who they do something really interesting method, methodologically actually in that they, interrogate one of the algorithms driving the uh, Turnitin plagiarism detection um, and then they put the functionality of that algorithm up against an ethnography that they have completed of a group of international students um, at, I think it was at Lancaster University and they show in this paper which you'll find in the Google document how the winnowing algorithm within Turnitin actively functions to constitute international students as plagiarists when, when they aren't, um, and as you know, other stu UK-based students as not plagiarists when some of them are. So uh, I think in terms of our capacity as teachers to be able to interrogate algorithms and how they work within our learning environments is something that we need to be addressing as researchers and educational developers. We need to think about how do we learn to get good at this stuff. Um, Another interesting paper just earlier this year from Carla Perotta and um, Ben Williamson again, interrogating cluster analysis as it's used in learning analytics um, and the way in which this, some forms of learning analytics um, kind of, well they say, assume in a circular way that the expert knowledge of data science is needed to support the forms of learning which are surfaced by data science. So there's this kind of closed circuit whereby particular reality is advocated through research which makes that research um, a, a kind of um, a condition of understanding. So I think that this is a really interesting strand of research and I would like to see kind of more um, uh, critical algorithmic kind of uh, research in uh, education generally. Um, I think the other thing that we need to kind of think about is, is why, why might we want to do, why might we want to engage with the automation of teaching? Um, I continually go back to this quote from, it's actually from Patrick Supers, you can't see it here, um, from 1966, where he says that, you know, this was, you know, back in 1966, he was saying in just a few more years, we, millions of school kids are going to have access to um, 
a, a kind of electronic equivalent of Aristotle. Um, we'll, we'll all have access to automated tutors that can guide us through our studies. Um, so there was this kind of strongly democratizing kind of impulse behind automation there, which is, you know, continues to be followed up by researchers now. Um, so, I, yeah, you can see that reference. I'm referencing here the report on Intelligence Unleashed that came through from Rose Luckin and colleagues at UCL earlier this year. Well, again, as, as Patrick Supers was doing in 1966, they, said, they talk about the value of one-to-one -one human tutoring as being the most effective approach to teaching and learning. And probably not many of us in this room would deny that. But then, then they go on to, to, um, to say, unfortunately, one-to-one -one tutoring is untenable for all students. Not only will there never be enough human tutors, it would also never be affordable. All of this begs the question, how can we make the positive impact of one-to-one -one tutoring available to all learners across all subjects? Um, and my problem with that, with that paragraph is that it assumes um, that it's inevitable that we will never be able to afford one-to-one -one tutors for everybody, rather than acknowledges that this is a social, economic, and political choice. Right? Our elite students, the students who go to Oxford, Cambridge, other elite institutions do have access to one-to-one -to -one tutoring. Um, so I think, for me, this is a kind of a nice example of a kind of determinism and a, a kind of um, solutionism, if you like, where a problem is constructed as an, inevi an inevitability, and technology is then posed as the answer to that problem. It's, it's a really good report in some ways, but there are aspects of it which I think are unhelpful. Um, so it's not surprising then that over the history of digital education or the, over the recent history of digital education, there's been a strong kind of resistance to this sense in which, um, you know, well, the quote from Andrew Feenberg, the goal of corporate strategists is to replace for the masses face-to-face -face teaching with... Um, an industrial project, which, an, sorry, an industrial product which is infinitely reproducible. Um, and the response, as Feinberg was commenting back in 2003, is a kind of mobilization in defense of the human touch. And I think we have, we did, we, about a decade ago, we saw more of this. People were just saying, no, I'm not doing digital education. I want to be a body in a classroom with my students and I want to see their faces and um, hear their sighs and hear the scratching of their pens. And that's what real teaching is. Um, Sue Clegg wrote one of my favourite papers actually in the, in the area again you know, 13 years ago now where she talks about the need to introduce a critical pedagogy approach into um, what we called e-learning back then um, one which refocuses attention away from the functionality of e-learning environments back to the core relations between students and teachers and the conditions in which they find themselves um, again there's a lot to, to sympathise with in this perspective but I think it's 13 years down the line, it's become quite problematic to see e-learning environments over here um, and human teachers and students over here and to see those two things, those two groups as being in binary, kind of opposed to each other in a kind of binary way. And in 2016, I think where we need to look is at the space in between, at the, spa the points at which human students and human teachers become entangled with technology um, rather than being um, in, in opposition to it. So there's this famous quote from Arthur C. Clarke, which um, is a really very popular kind of um, quote and a very familiar one to us. Where does this leave the human teacher? Any teacher who can be replaced by a machine should be. Um, you know, on the face of it, everyone goes, yeah, that's, that's true. Teachers, but actually, I think it's a deeply problematic statement. It assumes... It assumes that deficit in teachers can be addressed by automation, um, and it assumes that machines are capable of superseding teachers under certain conditions. And for me, this is one of the big issues that we have to work against as teachers, is this sense that, we, that teaching can be superseded by technology. I think we need to move to a position where we're seeing an entanglement of teachers and teaching and students with technology, um, rather. So, I mean, Tara Fenwick and Richard Edwards' work in this area is, is terrific. And as, as Tara Fenwick has said recently, the, the point is that material things are performative and not inert. Machines have an agency. So they will act together with other types of things and forces to exclude, invite, and regulate particular forms of participation in enactments, some of which we term education. Um, so methodologically, I think, I or keep going back to this quote from Andrew Pickering from some years ago now, where he says, although traditionally disciplines don't do this, but 
but we need to try to see double. We need to try to see the human and the non-human together um, rather than trying to strip one away from the other. Um, and I think that's quite, quite a big challenge for research in digital education in the current moment. Uh, there was a, an article in Wired which addressed these kind of issues a few, uh, a few months back saying, much more kind of simply, what well, everyone doesn't really realize that everything on the internet is a mixture of automation and humanity. That's just how the internet works. So that's, that's kind of where these two very brief kind of points were coming from, this idea that we don't need to see automation as impoverishing education. If we see technology as an entanglement with teaching, um, we can see it positively, um, but we do need to think about it critically and we need to think about how um, machine learning and artificial intelligence and analytics are recoding, reforming and reframing what it means to do education. But I think associated with these two points are a couple of other ones which I think are um, also important. I mean, this is the one about online teaching need not be complicit with the instrumentalization of education. I, for me, is one of the most important statements in the manifesto. Um, it's working against this idea that there's somehow uh, some kind of neoliberal, neoliberal performance kind of instrumentalization agenda um, that we're seeing affecting the way in which higher education is um, is governed at the moment of, of seeing online education as being complicit with that and I don't think it has to be but I think that's about what we do as teachers and researchers when we work within this highly technologized space. Okay, I've, I've just flagged, again it's on the Google document that hopefully you'll be able to link to but if you want to read some more um, on these specific manifesto points um, they are there in the work of myself and my colleagues at Edinburgh. Okay, so I have about another 10 minutes. I want to use that to talk about another aspect of the manifesto, which relates to the changing conceptions and, and shifting nature of university space um, in the digital era. So again, we have, a, we have quite a few points in the manifesto which cover, the, which try to kind of shift this position that um, online is some kind of second best option. I think we open the manifesto by saying online can be the privileged mode at distance is a positive principle, not a deficit. Um, we have some points on space being um, continuing to be important online and on distance not just being about distance in space but can be about distance in time, um, political and effective distance. Um, so really this is, this is coming from again a body of research um, in spatial theory which talks about how in the current era, we need to think about space as, an, as something which is becoming, something which is emergent, not as something which is fixed and given. So Rob Kitchen, um, Kitchen and Dodge's book on code space, um, I would really recommend if you haven't already read that one. It kind of it, it outlines changing conceptions of space from Euclidean space, which is space which we can measure and is objectively um, um, perceived to relational space, which is about space which is contingent and produced through social relations, to space which they call ontogenic ideas of space, which is really a focus on how space becomes. So if we see the university not, for me it's been quite a, this theory has really helped me think very differently about what it means to do distance education. If we think about the university not as a place or a set of buildings or a campus, but rather think about it as a set of practices, um, and a set of relations that fundamentally shifts what, what, we, what we think about when we think about distance education. It means that the space of the university is genuinely a global space which is enacted through the practices of our students who may be on campus and may not. Um, yeah, where is no longer a simple question in education, I would say. Um, I'm going to skip over this bit. So we need to, drawing on mobility's theory, think about the university as a space of flux and flow by which, and I'm quoting from Shella and Uri's work here on um, mobilities theory, host, guests, buildings, objects, all this stuff are contingently brought together to produce certain performances in certain places at certain times. And I think that applies really nicely um, to the university. So for me, one of the most important critical kind of takings from this area of theory is this idea about sedentarism. Um, so again, Shella and Uri um, kind of foreground this notion in which in the emergent mobilities theory undermines sedentarist theory which treats as normal stability, meaning and place and treats as abnormal distance, change and placelessness. So 
we need to kind of think, work against this kind of, I, what I think is still a really endemic sedentarism within universities where we, we do tend to think about what happens on campus as being the authentic academic experience and what happens off campus as being somehow, somehow other. Um, so we see this kind of, I think distance education as a term itself discursively others um, distance, distance education it assumes education is what happens on campus and distance education is what happens um, online um, and we need to try to shift this and I think one of the ways in which we enact this sedentarism as, as universities is in our, our publicity and our promotional materials and we do this a lot at Edinburgh um, because we have a beautiful campus and beautiful city so we continually kind of use it as a way of framing and publicizing what it means to be a university. Um, and I, I would argue that it's through this kind of fetishization of the campus that we con construct a kind of insiders and outsiders by depending on this kind of bounded space which we see as the authentic university space. So how can we shift that uh, to take account of digital space? So Edinburgh, actually last week, um, an email went around to all, all students who were on courses um, in which someone had been diagnosed with measles. I don't know if you've had the measles outbreak here, but it's been quite a big deal for us. But this email went out to our distance students as well. You know, these are students in Ghana, in Tanzania, in Australia. Um, and they, that's the students, they, they're good, good natured. They thought it was hilarious. But I was just like, this, this isn't okay. You know, it's not okay to assume um, that, that the on-campus experience is the normal, normative experience of being a student at Edinburgh. So we had, um, we had a research project uh, two or three years ago which actually asked this, this question, what does it mean to be a student at Edinburgh but not in Edinburgh? Um, and we asked us, some of our distance learning students to send us images of their study spaces and stories about, about where they studied and what it meant to study, even though these, these are just students who had never come to the university but very much felt themselves to be part of the university. And we got this very nice kind of mixed picture of what it means to be a distance student. M many of our students were very kind of anchored in highly domestic spaces. Um, like this is one of our um, students at the time who just had a baby. His university was that bed and that laptop with that baby. Um, others were talking about how they, you know, their space, their university space was the kitchen table with the baby snorting on the side. Um, other students talked about their connection with the university and with the city as being about a question of diaspora. So we had quite a few students saying that they had a family history and a family heritage um, uh, issuing, issuing from Scotland. Um, this, the, the quote I've given you here is a student who is based in the US who traced his family back from, through three waves of migration from Scotland to the US. And he ended by saying, well, I." by registering on this online program with Edinburgh, I was, it was a kind of virtual homecoming for me. Um, so there's a strongly kind of sentimental connection to the university, which was nothing to do with being present on campus. Other students were very, you know, what you might expect from um, distance students, highly mobile um, professionals engaging with their course um, from multiple countries, multiple cities, multiple continents sometimes, um, studying all over in hotel rooms. So these were students who were constructing the space of the university on buses, in coffee shops, in hotel rooms, at airports. Um, so I think, I'll skip that bit, I think, I think we need to think seriously about what it means to be a student in higher education um, in a kind of, in a digital era, era and start to try to rethink what the space of the university in particular constitutes. And that's what these um, particular points in the manifesto were trying to address, culminating in what I think is probably my favourite manifesto point, which is, if don't succumb to campus, campus envy, we are the campus. And this is a kind of call to arms, really, for our distance students to feel they are the campus. It doesn't matter where they're based. Um, they do constitute the university. Again, there's a couple of um, papers I've highlighted in the Google Doc, which uh, specifically and directly address this particular research project. Um, so before I end, um, I just want to explain why we produced a manifesto. Um, why didn't we just write a, a series of research papers or make a video or make some blog posts or, or whatever. And we were quite kind of um, influenced by what Latour says about what it means to create a manifesto. He says it makes explicit a subtle but radical transformation in the definition of what it means to progress, that is to process forward and meet new prospects, not as a war cry for an avant-garde to move even further and faster ahead, but rather as a warning, a call to attention. 
And that's really what we were trying to do by writing this particular manifesto. It's a, a call to attention, a call to kind of think seriously and critically about the big kind of social, political, economic, pedagogic kind of um, movements that, are, start, that are, are currently shaping our field and how we want to address them as researchers, but also as um, engaged and committed practitioners. And on that point, I'll end with a link to the, um, to the references um, for this talk um, and to my email address if you want to follow, me up, uh, follow up on anything. Thank you for listening.